So at the outset, I would like to thank the ASI and all the office bearers for the opportunity here. I will be talking on the genitourinary emergencies in children. So what basically are emergencies? Emergencies are unforeseen situations. They can be unpredicted, unexpected, and unanticipated. And of course, they require immediate attention. Now, the pediatric emergencies are unforeseen, uh, unforeseen problems. But the main reason why these are unforeseen problems are that they are unseen before. So if you are in a small city and a general surgeon working in a small city, it, it may be highly possible that you may not have seen a pediatric surgical emergency in your initial phase of practice. And suddenly when you come across uh, an, a, a pediatric surgical emergency in the middle of the night, you may get baffled as to what exactly is this problem. So this is how such seminars and such meetings do help budding general surgeons as to make them aware of what pediatric surgical emergencies look like and what are the primary things that they need to do at their level in order to save the child's life. So the main thing to be taken care of in pediatric surgery is the power of examination. Most of the pediatric surgical diagnoses are written on the child itself, but you need to have the eyes and the mind to see that. Okay, it is not what you look at that matters, but it's what you see. And unless the mind knows, the eyes are not going to see the diagnosis, even though it is written on the check. So a few examples of some unseen problems. On the left, a child comes to you with an umbilical hernia. You have seen an umbilical hernia before and you can easily diagnose it. You say, yes, this is an umbilical hernia. But once you remove the nappy, you would be able to see that the child has got a left inguinal hernia and a right undescended testis also. So these are the unseen problems then that can lead to prop surgical emergencies and later disasters. So the unseen potential emergencies are problems which may remain silent like inguinal hernias, undescended testis or prepuce related problems, or they can be misleading problems like an acute scrotum. Just like Robert started his chronology from the top, I will be starting my chronology from below the bed. And it is important to remember that these potential emergencies really hit you hard below the bed. So inguinal hernias, they may be present in boys and girls and they may be either unilateral or bilateral. Why do inguinal hernias happen in children? It's basically the patency of the processus vaginalis which, which through which the testis has come down. Now the processus vaginalis normally, the processus vaginalis normally closes by its own after the testis has come down. However, when it remains open, the intestine comes through it and creates a bulge, which is called a hernia. Now hernias, pediatric hernias are to be operated earliest after the diagnosis, irrespective of the age. Age and weight are no more a criteria for surgery. And the important thing to remember is that smaller the child and smaller the hernia, larger are the chances of complications. Seen here are pictures of obstructed hernia. This is a girl with an obstructed hernia, and you can see visible loops of bowel. This is a boy with a her obstructed hernia, which has got strangulated, and you can visibly see that he's got peritonitis. Now, when you are a general surgical consultant in a small city and you get a child with an obstructed inguinal hernia, what should be done? The first thing is to hospitalize the child. A nasogastric tube placement is advisable. Gradual and gentle reduction of the inguinal hernia under IV sedation would be an ideal, ideal thing to do. If you have a good anesthetic friend who is ready to stand by, it would be the best thing for your support. If the hernia reduces with IV sedation, you can operate the child after 24 hours once the edema subsides. And if you are familiar operating pediatric hernias or else you can refer the child to the pediatric surgeon. Emergency surgery is required only if the hernia does not reduce or there are signs of strangulation. Of course, if the child has got peritonitis that, like the right one in the corner, a laparotomy would be necessary. 
Now, how does the hydrocele differ from the hernia? I, I agree that hydrocele is not a surgical emergency, but there is an important condition which may sometimes mislead the, the surgeon to believe that it's an obstructed hernia. Hydrocele's are painless scrotal swellings and the etiology is same as that of an hernia. Hydrocele's may be either communicating encysted hydrocele's or non-communicating. Now, this pathology, which is called an encysted hydrocele is important in that it can mimic an obstructed inguinal hernia. Now, an encysted hydrocele is a hydrocele which is separate from the testis. It is painless. There is no impulse on cuffing and it is a non-reducible and cystic structure. So how to differentiate it from an obstructed hernia? When the child will have an encysted hydrocele, it will, it will be there in a well child. I mean, just unlike the obstructed hernia, the child will not be irritable. The important clinical sign that you need to elicit is that when you pull the testis on the same side, that will fix the swelling. The margins of the encysted hydrocele are also well appreciable. And of course, ultrasound scan will help to identify the uh, identify and confirm the diagnosis. The other unseen problems which remain silent are undescended testis. Undescended testis are mainly seen in preterm children. It is only 3% in term babies. They can be unilateral or bilateral. The important thing to document when you are examining the, examining the child's genitals is to make sure whether the child has got a hypoplastic scrotum and whether both the testicles are present in the scrotum or not. Now, this is a child which has got a left-sided undescended testis. Looking at the guidelines, we are waiting on this child for about nine to 12 months of age in order to operate it. The child comes in the middle of the night with a painful left inguinal swelling with some redness of the skin above. Now, what could this be? Now, this could be commonly uh, misconsidered as an inguinal node which has got infected and the child may be put on antibiotics and analgesics. However, if nobody has seen that the left testis is missing, this torsion of the undescended testis would never have been thought of. Now, this child had a left undescended testis which was in the inguinal region and had got torted. Okay, so sometimes you may have problems with undescended testis as well. Now we come to the next problem, which are related to the prepuce. Now, unfortunately, because of Facebook guidelines, I have to, uh, I have to, I mean, hide the uh, genital problems. And so it will be more of a theoretical description. So what exactly is phimosis? Phimosis is the inability to retract the foreskin over the glands. Now, the three important terminologies, one is the phimosis, where you cannot see the external urethral meatus. The second is a non-retractile foreskin, where the foreskin can be retractile, can be made wide so that the meatus can be seen, but it would not stretch over the glands. And the third is what is called paraphimosis. That is when the uh, prepuce is forcefully stretched over the glands and then it fails to come back, it causes edema and creates a emergency which is called paraphimosis. Now, this is the graph which shows the natural history of the non-retractile foreskin. And in almost 80% of the children, the, uh, the phimosis disappears by the age of two years. Emergency situations with the prepuce can be, of course, inflammatory conditions like balanopostitis. These are predominantly treated with antibiotics and analgesics. And once the edema and the inflammation settles down, uh, the child can be offered a circumcision. The other would be accidental injuries like a zip injury. The important thing to remember when the child comes to you with a zip injury is not to pull the zip down, but to pull the zip up. Now, when you do that, there is a high likelihood that the zip will come off the prepuce. Sometimes we do get emergency situations where, I mean, these are of course rare, where a quack did a circumcision and in order to prevent bleeding, a horse hair was tied and it got the glands to chop off. 
Now, what would you do when a child comes to you with paraphimosis? First, hospitalize the child, give sedation or a short anesthetic, gentle compression is needed, gradually push the glands and bring the prepuce over it. If this is difficult or not possible, you may try making multiple punctures in order to release the edema over the prepuce and rarely a dorsal slit may be required in order to bring the skin down. Of course, these children may go into urinary retention and may require a planned catheterization. Now we come to the unforeseen problems which may be misleading. A child comes to you in your OPD with a tender red scrotum. The classical history that is given by the mother is that the child has got injured while playing cricket or maybe an insect has bitten the child. Workup can be done if these children come in routine hours like a color Doppler or even a nuclear scanning if you are in a big center. But the golden rule is any acute scrotum is torsion of the testis unless proved otherwise. Whenever in doubt, it's always safe to explore. So if the child comes with an acute scrotum in the middle of the night, you do not have access to an ultrasound, etc. It's always safe to explore. Sometimes torsion of the testicular appendages may also mimic a case of acute scrotum. For a, now on the left is a, is a child with a, acute, with a torsion of the testis who was brought in good time. The vascularity is preserved and the testis could be saved. To the right is a child with a torsion testis which has undergone gangrene and in the right corner is a child with a torsion of the appendix of the testis on the left which also mimicked an acute scrotum. Sometimes ep acute epididymoarchitis may also mimic an acute scrotum. The important things to remember for acute epididymoarchitis is that it is uncommon in childhood. It is seen predominantly in infants with either urinary tract infections or vasicoureteric reflux. It can be recurrent in children with neurogenic bladder, ectopic ureters, or persistent mullerian duct remnants. The children may present with scrotal pain, dysuria, or foul smelling urine, and fever and other systemic symptoms may also be present. These children predominantly require medical management with analgesia and antibiotics. Inflammatory conditions like scrotal abscesses may also mimic acute scrotum. Sometimes idiopathic scrotal edema can also present as an acute scrotum. The important thing to remember here is that pain is minimal or absent. This is how it differentiates itself from a torsion testis. The peak incidence is about five to six years. There is marked edema of the scrotum and it may extend into the subcutaneous tissues as it is seen here. This condition resolves spontaneously with just oral supportive medications. Now a child comes with urinary retention. Urinary retention is one of the most common uh, genital urinary emergencies which would be coming to a general surgeon. Now it is mandatory to drain an accumulated urine and this can be done either by temporary drainage or corrective surgery. The principle is that the fountain must flow. Now, acute urinary retention can be either because of outlet obstruction. For example, a stone which is impacted in the navicular fossa, as you can see here. This just needs a short anesthetic and the stone can be pulled out. But we need to have this problem in mind in order to suspect it. Sometimes children may have post circumcision severe neonatal stenosis. Children who have undergone religious circumcision in the neonatal period may develop severe neonatal stenosis and may also present with partial urinary retention. Outlet obstructions in neonates can be because of a condition which is called posterior urethral valves. Dr. V.K. Shagrawal would be taking this problem in details in the neonatal surgical emergencies section. But the important carry home message for the general surgeon is that just placing a urethral catheter can sometimes save the child's life in a child with a posterior urethral valve. You don't need to put a fancy Foley's catheter, just a six French infant feeding tube can gently guide through the valve into the urinary bladder and save the child's life. Sometimes non-urological causes can also cause acute urinary retention. For example, constipation is a very important cause of 
retention in girls. In girls, the vagina, the rectum is quite close to the urethra. And when the child develops constipation, the large fecalomas can compress over the urethra and cause partial urinary retention. Sometimes other non-urological causes like hydrocolpus or pyocolpus, which is the distension of the vagina caused by accumulation of fluid due to congenital vaginal obstruction may also cause urinary retention. It is often caused by an imperforate hymen or a vaginal septum. And this compresses the, ure uh, the urethra leading to incomplete evacuation and urinary retention. As is seen here, because of the this is the collection of the fluid because of the imperforate hymen and it has caused urinary retention. Non-urological causes like spina bifida occulta may also prevent complete emptying of the urinary bladder. So it is important that the entire patient is examined and this includes examining the back also. Sometimes retroperitoneal or presacral tumors may also compress over the urethra and cause urinary retention. So you have to keep uh, an eye on the entire 3D picture, which can cause urinary retention in a child. Ovarian torsion is an, another important genital urinary emergency, which may present with an acute abdomen. This res the results because of twisting of the ovary on its pedicle. It mimics other causes of acute abdomen. The pain would be a sudden onset, constant lower abdominal or pelvic pain, and it may be associated with nausea, vomiting, and urinary symptoms. It is very difficult to pick up an ovarian torsion just on clinical examination, and hence ultrasound is a very important diagnostic tool. However, it is important that you inform the radiologist to specifically see for the pelvic viscera, especially when you are sending a girl with unexplained acute abdominal pain for an ultrasound scan. These children can be diagnosed and treated with minimally invasive surgery. This is a left, a right ovarian torsion. And this was a, again a picture of a large ovarian cyst which underwent torsion. Sometimes genitourinary emergencies may not be medical emergencies, they may be social emergencies. Parents may come to you saying, is my child a boy or a girl? Disorders of sexual differentiation is a major social challenge as well. And it is important that we do not commit unless the child is fully investigated. When to suspect disorders of sexual differentiation? Whenever you see a child with ambiguous genitalia, a child with clitoromegaly or micropenis, a child with proximal hypospadias and undescended testis, child with bilateral undescended testis, delayed or unexpected changes at puberty, partial labial fusion, inguinal ovaries in a male or testis in a female when you operate for hernia. The important carry home message is do not commit unless fully investigated. Because if you stamp the child as a boy or a girl and then on further investigation, when it turns out to be otherwise, it becomes a very major social challenge for the family. A quick few slides on genitourinary trauma. 80 to 85% of genitourinary trauma are blunt trauma. They are mainly secondary to road traffic accidents, fall from heights, sports injuries, or a direct blow to the abdomen. 60% of these trauma, trauma patients are renal traumas. It rarely occurs in isolation and other major viscera or orthopedic injuries are always associated. Management as Dr. Kanishka Das already stated is airway, breathing, circulation and D is deal with the cause. Overall renal traumas can be managed conservatively. Surgery is required only in hemodynamically unstable patients with severe intraperitoneal penetrating injuries vascular injuries or urinary extravasation. Bladder injuries can be either extraperitoneal or intraperitoneal. Most of the extraperitoneal bladder injuries, surgical intervention is required in if there are concerns about the bladder neck being lacerated. And most of the times indwelling catheter su suffices for extraperitoneal bladder injuries. If the bladder injury is, however, intraperitoneal, then surgical repair is mandatory, which can be done either by open surgery or laparoscopic surgery. 
we recently had a child who had a interesting mode of injury this was a one one year old child who whose father accidentally fell on the child and this caused a bladder injury it was an intraperitoneal bladder injury which was then repaired laparoscopically so with this i end i end my talk the carry home messages are that when you are in a small city as a general surgeon and you come with child with with a child with genital urinary emergency you can either send the child to a pediatric surgeon who is across the road or in the next city however before you transfer the child you should look think act and then transfer as dr kanishka das said inadequate transfer or transfer of an inadequately prepared child may sometimes cost the child his or her life so with that i'd like to thank you all this is a book of pediatric surgery a ready reckoner for all general surgeons also and uh, people can communicate to me if they require a copy and thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you dr amar for the succinct and lucid presentation we'll go on to the next topic because we are running short of time i invite dr vikesh agrawal for his presentation on neonatal emergencies